Hi everyone, I'm Shannon Cornthwaite. I have an associate's degree in psychology and sociology, bachelor's degree in psychology and criminal justice, and I'm currently working on my master's degree in clinical counseling. And today, this channel seems to be growing um, with my mental health videos, particularly the BPD videos. So I wanted to go over a therapist client activity for you from this book, The Clinician's Guide, Diagnosis and Treatment of Personality Disorders by Daniel J. Fox, PhD. Uh, this is the, does have the DSM-5 updates, case studies, client activities, proven treatments. Uh, this was prior to the DSM-5 TR, text revision. I'm gonna go over this activity and I'm gonna play the part of both therapist and client. I'm not gonna switch places and do skits or anything like that. I'm just gonna go over these questions and answer them to the best of my ability and maybe they'll help you. If you want, you can stop the video after each question and answer it yourself. So let's get into it. When you feel alone or empty, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Honestly, when I feel alone and empty, I'm not really thinking much of anything. Really, a lot of times I just sit in complete silence. I've found myself here lately doing this. Um, eventually, I do start to think about... Not really having many friends. I mean, I have my wife, my children. I have a handful of friends that I can depend on when need be. But to me, it feels like uh, I'm always alone. And when it gets really, really bad, I wonder the thoughts that come into my mind make me wonder if anyone would even care if I was gone. Obviously, I know that's not the case. I've put a lot of work into myself over the years and my wife has helped me out a lot with it. And I know that people would care, care if I was gone, they would miss me. Um, but sometimes those intrusive thoughts just come in out of nowhere. And there is a therapy technique I'll show you in another video to help not really get rid of those intrusive thoughts, but not dwell on them. And I'll show you that in another video. Uh, do you see the a need for change that is possible in your future? During the height or depth of my BPD, particularly the, the depressive episodes, yeah, there was a need. I am currently working to fulfill that need uh, with school. Um, I'm a substitute teacher uh, while I'm at school, focusing on my family and relationships, stuff like that. Back then, what I needed to do was focus on inner reflection and all the things that led to me developing BPD, which I've gone over in previous videos. It was an eight part video series. Check it out on, on the playlist. Uh, how could therapy help you achieve change? It, it's helped me to understand where my trauma came from, where my fears of abandonment came from. And it's helped me to understand myself and why I have the feelings that I have on occasion. Uh, what has worked in therapy before and what has not. I don't really do traditional therapy. I've tried it a few times, but it's always been difficult for me to keep on track with it. Uh, so now what I do is I just, I talk with my wife. She has, she's a nurse and she's basically been my therapist. I talk with her about just about everything mainly the stuff from my past, from my childhood, adolescence, young adult years. And she asks me if what I think about certain situations, if I think this or if I think that came about because this happened, stuff like that. So that really helps. What is the most difficult urge you have and what thought or action precedes it? The most difficult urge has always been ending it. In my 20s, these urges were far more common they do occasionally come up whenever I have a depressive episode, and that's usually preceded by the thoughts that would anybody really care if I was gone? Feelings of abandonment, feelings of not really being cared about, see it? They, they aren't as common now uh, that I've been working on myself, but they do still come up, and it takes a lot for me to fight back against them. When was the last time you felt emotionally overwhelmed because someone you loved or needed might leave you and what happened? It was actually a few years back. Uh, my grandparents had moved back to Illinois from Florida uh, right before a major hurricane hit and um, they lived with my brother for a while. 
Uh, they had a falling out, moved into an apartment, and I was over there every day, uh, just about every day, really, helping them with their medicines, taking them to the doctor's appointments, taking them to the store, uh, meeting them at the hospital whenever something happened or whatever, and they had to call an ambulance. I was there for them constantly, and I got a call from my aunt saying that, asking me if what she heard is true and what was going on about, I guess my grandparents had told somebody in the family that they had bought tickets to move, uh, go back to Florida, to move back to Florida. Spur of the moment, I guess. I don't know. There was really nothing there for them anymore because the house was destroyed and all this. And so when I went and I asked, talked to them about it, my grandpa was like, there's nothing here for us anymore. You know, we don't have any friends or family here. And when he said that, it just kind of flipped a switch in me. And I, I flipped out because I felt like I wasn't being seen as family. It felt like they were abandoning me, abandoning, uh, abandoning me all over again. Because growing up, uh, they would take their vacations every year on my birthday and go to Florida. Uh, they helped raise me, me and my brother. Uh, with my mom uh, and every year on my birthday they would take their vacation and go to Florida and then they left in 1996 to move to Florida and then sold the family farm in 1998 which caused us to move because we were living on the family farm that had been in our uh, family for that was the last time it happened and I was very emotionally overwhelmed I I blew up um, I started crying my older cousin who was there she was like 60s 50 60s something like that um was going off on me saying you're a grown man there you shouldn't be crying and all this stuff and it was just those feelings of abandonment really really got to me because uh as stated in my how i developed bpd videos um my father pretty much abandoned the family when I was two years old, about to turn three. Um, he showed up for my brother's birth because my mom was pregnant at the time. Uh, he didn't come to my birthday, my third birthday. He didn't come to any birthday after that until my 16th birthday. And we saw maybe once or twice a year if we were lucky. Then on top of other instances, um, everything just kind of hit and led me into better understanding myself and searching, uh, trying to figure out what's going on with me because this actually happened right before I started college. So I was like, I wanna say I was 35, 36 years old, somewhere around there. Uh, I'm 40 now, for those of you wondering about ready to turn 41 in a couple months. Uh, how would you describe your relationship with friends and lovers now? Those relationships are pretty stable, pretty solid. Now that I've done work on myself, um, I can I can say that they're pretty pretty stable. My wife has helped me out a lot. Uh, prior to this, though, my relationships were very unstable. It took my wife a long time to get it through my thick skull that I could trust her not to uh, abandon me like other people have. That she wasn't going anywhere. Prior to this, though, I was a mess. If I, if, if a girlfriend broke up with me, especially one that I really, really loved, I would just, I would sink into a huge depression. I would constantly try to contact them uh, to work things out, to, and, and I would lash out. So I'd be like, but you said you love me, uh, stuff like that. Very hard time. Um, this was in my 20s. I met my wife in my late 20s, mid to late 20s. And since we've been together, uh, things have been a lot better for me because we've done all the work together. But there for a while, particularly in my 20s, I was, I, I was a bomb waiting to go off. I, I wasn't abusive or anything like that. But when I got into a relationship, particularly with someone that I really, really loved, really liked, my whole world revolved around them. I would lose jobs and just focus all my attention on them and really flood them with attention and affection. And uh, it wasn't healthy. And I wouldn't go out and look for jobs 
during this time um, because I wanted to spend as much time with them as I could. And it wasn't healthy. It wasn't healthy for either one of us. And so those relationships eventually ended. Uh, how do you, how does your view of yourself change from day to day? It actually changes moment to moment. Um, I don't really have self-concept. For those of you who don't know, I am both autistic and have BPD. Having a sense of self has been really difficult for me. Um, one of my stems and special interests is TV. Um, always has been. And when I really connect with a character, really like a character, I will, both subconsciously and consciously, I will take on their characteristics. I'll dress more like them, act a little more like them, until that kind of wears off. The same with uh, when I'm around people that just have a way about them, not necessarily that I like or maybe admire, I will take on their characteristics as my own. This happened a lot, particularly back when I was doing tattooing in my early 20s, I would take on characteristics of my mentors, you know, and that was very toxic. So it, it just depends on how I'm feeling in the moment, um, what I'm doing in that moment to determine uh, how I view myself that moment rather than that day. When was the last time you tried to hurt yourself to get someone to love you? I don't think I really did it to get anyone to love me. I planned it out uh, when I was going through my first divorce. I say first divorce, but divorce from my first marriage. I was drinking. Um, I was going to use a knife, you know. Um, texted some people and uh, it was mainly my soon-to-be ex-wife. I texted her and I said uh, goodbye and then within a few minutes her and some friends were at my door breaking my door down basically um, and put a picture of my daughter in front of me and told me if I was gonna do it I had to look at her while I was gonna while I did it um, and that kind of snapped me out of it um, I have had thoughts after that um, one time was Shortly after a rela another relationship ended, that I, I was madly in love with this person, you know, is one of those instances where I just, they consumed me. Uh, and when that relationship ended, um, I started having thoughts of ending it. Uh, and I had a friend of mine take me to the hospital because I, I didn't want that. Um, and the hospital, they... The doctor I saw, he could care less. He gave me some antipsychotics and sent me on my way. But I never really did it to make anyone love me. What have you done in the past to prevent a loved one from leaving? I begged them to stay. With tears streaming down my face, I've begged them to stay. That was about it. I, I didn't really do much other than that. And I'm not sure why. Uh, a lot of people will threaten to kill, particularly with BPD, they'll threaten to take their own lives. Um, if someone leaves them or whatever. For me, I wasn't going to... I didn't want to do that. It, it was more just me begging them to stay, to not leave. And then after the fact, whenever I would have those pseudo suicidal thoughts. Um, and when I got to the point that I was wanting to do it to myself, I, I would write a letter. I wouldn't blame them or anything. I would actually go out of my way to say this wasn't their fault. And I think that was just me wanting to think that way, even though I did actually kind of blame them uh, because they couldn't love me, you know. But I didn't want to put that into my final words, I guess. What object are you closest to? Now, this goes for both my BPD and my autism. Uh, we have objects that help us stem. Um, mine is this right here. It's a, my childhood blanket. It's kind of a mess. <laughs> it's falling apart, but it, it's mainly the uh, satin trim around the edges. It reminds me of my great-grandmother. 
um, because she had lots of blankets like that and that I kind of inherited after she passed away. Um, and that helps to relax me, to um, get me out of whatever I'm feeling in that moment. I've had people tell me that I'm a grown man. I should be, I shouldn't have a blankie anymore and stuff like that. My wife has been very supportive of me and my stems. Um, she's never said anything like that, but in past relationships, um, people have, um, and I have been teased by family members and quote unquote friends about it when they find out, um, now I am very open about it because you know what? I am autistic and I have mental health, um, problems that I need that. If I didn't have that, God knows what I would do. What mood is the most difficult for you control to control? I would say my anger. And if you know, if you have BPD or know anyone with BPD, you know that our emotions, our moods can change from minute to minute. Uh, we can be happy-go-lucky, easy-going one minute, and for whatever reason, something sets us off. Uh, it could be the smallest, excuse me, the smallest thing that sets us off, and we just want it. We just explode, um, or we want to explode. Over the years, I've learned to kind of hold back on that. I do get an attitude with people during these instances. Um, but I'm always worried that I'm going to hurt somebody when this happens. Um, so I have to maintain constant control over myself. It's not easy. Um, there are times when I just want to punch something, punch a wall, kick something, whatever. I'm, I'm the last time when I was a teenager and something like this happened, I nearly killed someone. Um, I got so mad that uh, I put them in a headlock. Their coat got pulled up over their face and got trapped in my arm. And I just, I saw red. Um, and all my a bunch of other people were there and they were screaming at me to let go that I was killing him, uh, that he couldn't breathe and stuff like that. When I finally snapped out of it and let go, uh, his face was blue, his mouth and tongue were purple. I nearly killed him. And since that moment, I've had to have constant control over my anger. Um, I never let myself get to that point anymore. Um, if I did, I likely wouldn't be here in front of the, uh, talking to you right now. I'd probably be in prison somewhere. Um, so I do have to have constant control. What do you find peaceful when I'm working out in my garage gym? Um, when I'm writing, I write books. Um, I haven't written in a while. I need to, but I've been focusing on school. Um, and then even just sitting and listening to an audiobook. Um, here lately, I've been catching myself. I'll just come to my office and I'll just sit in complete silence and just space out. Um, I'm not sure why. I just get in that zone and it's very peaceful. It's almost like a factory reset. Uh, when was the last time your anger got the best of you? I already explained that. It was uh, when I was a teenager. Well, no. There were times, um, particularly when one relationship ended, uh, when, when I would uh, send text messages to my ex um, I'm not too proud of now. And then I would also send messages to her then boyfriend that I'm not very proud of. Um, 
there was one instance with another ex where I uh, told her I missed her and uh, she laughed at me and I told her something very bad. I, I, I said that, well, I hope you yourself like your brother did. That wasn't one of my finer moments. When was the last time you engaged in a sex act and regretted it afterward and what did you do? I think it was when I was separated from my first wife. No. Well, that was one of them. We, we were separated. She was staying at a friend's house. Um, and I ran into an old girlfriend. Um, and she was you know, flirting with me very hard. And we didn't actually have sex. We got very close. Um, and then in another instance, before I met my wife, um, I met a girl off the internet and had a one night stand with her in the front seat of my car in a parking spot um, out by a lake. And then I never talked to her again. Uh, she tried messaging me on MySpace and I ignored her messages. I'm not too proud of that. Uh, that was the only time I did that. I was in a very low place at the time. Um, I can't remember what her name was now or anything or else I would try and contact her and apologize. And MySpace has changed so much, I don't even think it's kept the messages. Um, it, it's been over 15 years since that happened, so I'm not very proud of that. What does sex represent to you? Now it re Sorry, that's my phone going off. Now it represents intimacy. Um, it's a way for me and my wife to be close. Uh, even though we express show affection to each other uh, quite frequently. Um, now it just represents intimacy. Prior to getting with my wife, that was the only time I felt like my partner loved me, was when we were uh, in the throes of passion. Uh, and that was, it, that was very difficult on me. I knew that that was wrong. Um, I had tried talking to uh, somebody about it previously, and... I don't know, it, it was just one of those things where um, that was the only time I actually felt loved was during sex, during uh, intercourse. And it took a while. Um, it took becoming secure in my relationship with my wife for that to subside, you know. Uh, what is the best way for you to connect to someone? Talking to them, learning... Um, learning about them, uh, letting them learn about me, um, just talking to them. Um, prior to that, uh, prior, again, prior to my marriage, um, it, it was sex. Um, what would it be like to have a strictly professional relationship with another that is intimate and caring? Hmm. A strictly professional relationship with somebody that is intimate and caring. So, a personable professional relationship. They're not talking about a sexual relationship or anything like that. Uh, this would be like um, having a friend at work where, you know... You, you become really good friends outside of work. Um, and it doesn't go any further than that. Just strictly friends. Uh, this actually happened to me. Um, my first year of college, uh, there were a couple others same around the same age as me uh, starting out in college too. And we developed really good friendships. Um, one of them died during covid uh, the other one, uh, he's my best friend now. 
Um, when our car broke down in Indianapolis during the Indy 500 this past year, um, he drove three hours out of his way uh, to come pick us up and then drive, drove three hours out of his way to bring us home. Um, I never really experienced that before. Um, people have always wanted something in exchange um, or they've always said they couldn't do it for whatever reason, always had excuses and he just dropped what he was doing and he was there for me and my family. Um, and I'll never forget that. It, it was the first time I'd ex ever experienced anything like that. I And I actually, when he arrived at the hotel, I went up to him and gave him a big hug um, because I had never experienced that before. Um, final one, what would you change first in your life? I'm already doing it. Uh, I started doing it at the age of 36. I had always wanted to return to school, um, but never really thought I stood a chance because I'm not very good with math. And I knew that they would have me take math classes since um, I dropped out of high school and got my GED. Um, I would have to meet the math requirements. Um, my wife pushed me. She had... She put her faith in me. Um, she supported me. I went. And even though I didn't do well in the algebra classes, uh, my brain isn't math oriented. Uh, I can do simple math, but anything more than that, I, my brain just can't do it. Um, I don't know if it's dyscalculia or what. Um, I just can't do it. And... Even though I couldn't really do the math, my, my instructors, they saw that I was spending every available minute trying to learn, trying to understand these equations. Uh, my, my best friend, he would tutor me. Um, I would spend hours at home trying to get it down. Uh, doing all the school, all the homework, everything. I just couldn't get it. And they went, they went ahead and passed me. You know, they passed me with a C. Um, because I put forth that effort. And so that showed me that furthering my education was possible. It was attainable. Um, I just had to put in the work. Even if I didn't understand something. Just going as far as putting in the work showed my professors and my instructors that I, I was willing, that I wanted to learn. Um, and not everybody is math oriented. Uh, being, having a psychology degree, um, the only math we need is statistics. And there are programs that uh, we can run the numbers for us and do the equations for us. Um, even though I do still have trouble with understanding uh, certain things that has to do with statistics. Um, yeah. That'd be the one thing in my life that I wanted to change, and I am. I, at the age of 36, I returned to school. Uh, after dropping out midway through my senior year, back in 2001, uh, right after the towers fell. I graduated with my associates at 38, graduated with my bachelor's at 40, and now I'm working on my master's um, in order to help others. Um, so yeah, that'd be the one thing in my life. Uh, the first thing I would change, um, and I have already. Um, Right now, the first thing in my life that I would change. Uh, develop more lasting friendships. That would be the main one. Um, but that was it. Uh, that was the therap therapist client activity. Uh, we ran longer than I expected. I may edit this down. Cut out some of the... Uh, 
dead air stuff. Um, if you want to see more videos like this, uh, let me know in the comments below. Um, I do not mind whatsoever opening up to you guys. Uh, this channel uh, it's gone through a lot of changes over the years. It started out as a lawn care channel whenever I was starting my lawn care business, uh, which has, that community has grown into a massive YouTube community. The whole lawn care community has become massive over the years. Um, it's been just a, it was the proto channel for my come again TV channel that I now have. Um, that's where I, this is where I first started uploading videos for that. Um, it's been a blogging channel or vlogging channel, um, a review channel, different things. I was, I was never really quite sure what to do with this channel, um, because I have so many interests and I enjoy talking about all of them. Um, and for a time it was uh, about books. Um, I, those videos are still on here. Um, I'm not sure if all my other videos are public or not on here. Uh, if you want to go back and watch them, see how I've changed over the years. Um, now this channel I think is going to stay a mental health channel. Um, I'll talk about books on occasion. Um, I'll do some vlogs, uh, but it's mostly going to be mental health related. Uh, talk, talking about my own journey my own experiences. Um, and if those experiences, um, if that journey speaks to you at all, if you find yourself, uh, or your reflection in any of my experiences and talking about this helps you figure yourself out, uh, all the better. Uh, if you can't relate, uh, but you know somebody who may have similar experiences, maybe send them my way. Send them to this channel. I'm not a licensed therapist yet. Uh, I am currently in my second quarter. So um, I started on my master's uh, in the fall. Uh, it's now Jan the, uh, getting close to the end of January, mid January. Um, I've still got another almost year and a half left to go before I graduate and get my license. Uh, so I'm not an expert on this. I can only go off of what I see here, what I've learned so far and what I've experienced myself. Thanks for watching and, uh, like comment, subscribe and share.